Big Seance Podcast, Episode 72. My coverage of Casey Paracon 2016. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Hey there. As you probably know, I had the opportunity recently to attend the Kansas City Paranormal Conference, also known as KC Paracon. In episode number 68, I interviewed Jason Kupsik, the man who puts this conference together. So if you missed that episode, you may want to go back and catch that one. Today, for your paranerd pleasure, I bring you all the brief interviews from speakers that I was able to capture while I was there. After my Paracon coverage, I've got another Spectral Edition for you and some shout-outs and listener feedback. Let's get to it. The first interview I captured was from a duo known as Two Guys in the Know. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Bert Allen, and my partner in crime is Eric Girl, and together we're two guys in the know, so we do psychic medium readings. Um, so we are all about uh, tapping into information that we provide to you for your highest good. So we talk to angels, we talk to spirit guides, um, we do talk to loved ones that are on the other side, anyone that's out there to provide you with guidance. Um, we think of ourselves kind of as translators, so it's really your information, and we're just translating it and giving it to you. So you kind of take it and do with it as you would like. Um, we're not about convincing anyone that, yep, you have to believe it, yep. So if it's even just entertainment for you, we're about that too. So, yeah, we're excited to be here. I asked Eric and Bert if they do any work on the paranormal investigation side of things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we do house clearings, um, absolutely, you know, ghosts, all those types of things. So we take a kind of a different angle from it, not so much the scientific. Um, ours is more the spiritual angle. And so we, we will see ghosts, we'll see spirit. Um, and so for us, again, it's about... You know, is it for your highest good? So if having that energy in your house or your your place of business isn't for your highest good, it's bothering you, you know, we certainly work with that energy then to, to move it on, um, move it someplace else. Um, our, our belief is that unless it's paying rent, it doesn't have to be there. Um, but again, if it's not causing you any harm and doesn't bother you, then we just, we just leave things alone. And here's where you can find them. <laughs> yeah, you can visit us on our website. It's www.twoguysinthenow.com, and it's the number two. Um, yeah, we're based out of Minneapolis, but we do a lot of travel work, obviously, and we're excited to be in Kansas City. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice to meet you. Next up is David Glidden. I asked David what he'd be speaking about for his session at the conference. Well, today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is a, a problem that we have in the paranormal field is everybody's so cookie cutter. Everybody follows everything they see on TV. Well, uh, I'm going to be talking about a few things that I've come to uh, find in my own research that has opened my eyes and made me think about the paranormal in a completely different light. Uh, these are new ways uh, or new ideas that are out there. And uh, basically, I'm going to break down the fourth dimension and how it can correlate with the paranormal or life after death. Uh, also going to talk a little bit about uh, quantum physics and the, the uh, double slit experiment, uh, basically the observer effect. And then I, I've started doing experiments with trains and their correlation with uh, the paranormal. Um, from a long time ago, you know, we'd be out doing an uh, EVP session, and in the background you hear a train going off, and you're like, oh, there's another damn train. Well, we started thinking, well, what if the friction of the train going over the tracks puts out EMF? or some kind of energy because people subscribe to the thought that water can fuel paranormal activity but there's no substantial proof to back that up nobody's gone and measured that 
But with trains, I've actually gone out and measured, and what we found was that the tracks put off EMF. And uh, I've got some videos of us testing it and also another paranormal team who's tested it. And uh, I'm going to put a challenge out there to anybody that investigates the paranormal to when you're on an investigation and there is a train, go get readings after the train has passed, get a video of it, and they can send it to me. I'm going to collect a database, and uh, that way we have like this, this log of all these teams and their findings, and we can put that together and put that out there for a new um, theory for people on their paranormal experiences. I then asked David if he subscribed to the theory that spirits use and manipulate sound to produce their communication, specifically EVP. And I love his answer here. It makes me want to kick myself for not coming up with this technique back when I was more active in the paranormal investigation field. Absolutely. Uh, I've got a, several experiments that I run with my paranormal team. We use uh, cell phones. We, uh, we actually we have a thing called the 2020 where we take 20 questions and we record them at 20 hertz. It's said when a spirit communicates, it uses a frequency that we don't hear, which would be a lower frequency generally or an extremely high frequency. Uh, so we record these questions at 20 hertz, and we also record it at negative 20 hertz, and we replay it in the uh, investigation. And we leave the room, we leave a recorder in there. You won't pick up on your recorder any of the questions, but sometimes we actually get sounds or responses. Uh, it's, it's not something we've continually gotten evidence on. It's, I would say maybe 20% of the time that we've done it, we've actually gotten something. Uh, but with our cell phone experiment, where we have a, a caller call a cell phone from a different location, and we'll put them on speakerphone, put them in a room all by themselves uh, with a recorder, we'll leave, and they'll do an EVP session on speakerphone. And this way, when we speak, we're speaking in acoustics, and through a cell phone, it's an electronic frequency. So we'll, uh, we'll leave the cell phone in there, they'll do the EVP session, and about 60% of the time, we've actually been able to pick up either sounds within the room, EVPs over the phone, where the uh, person on the phone has heard uh, voices or, or static, or we've actually picked up audio on our recorder from within the room. But uh, we experiment with sound a lot, and we've even got a device that's still in experimental phase. We're still making tweaks and adjustments. We got the schematics from a Thomas Edison design. And uh, basically what, it, what the goal of it is is to transfer energy into an audio frequency that we would be able to hear. So that's something we're still working on, something we're still experimenting with. And, you know, sound is a very important part of the paranormal field because that's a third of your investigation. So here's more about David and where you can find him. Uh, I am the founder of Four State Paranormal. We investigate mainly the uh, four states of Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Kansas. We have traveled with out, uh, out of our area. We also have a web show called Haunting History, which you can find on uh, YouTube. And we also have a podcast called Paranormal Frequencies. And the uh, website for that is paranormalfrequencies.podbean.com. Thank you for having me on. When I caught up with Brandon Callahan... He had just finished speaking, and I wanted him to tell you all about his book. How's it going? Uh, uh, yeah, actually, my main discussion is uh, my new book, The Agony That Remains, uh, is officially coming out Monday, August 8th. Um, got some copies here, pre, pre-release copies to sell at the conference. Um, and just talking about the location uh, based down in northeast Oklahoma, a uh, town called Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Um, basically, the ley line research that I do typically is kind of what took me to that area. Um, if you're not familiar with ley lines, there's a lot of different theories. It's something that I actively use to really research and find these different stories to tell. And um, it's also where the infamous Trail of Tears ended as well. Uh, so the land we were working on was owned by a couple gentlemen of Cherokee Indian descent. And reports of activity from UFO activity, alien encounters, to uh, cryptids, Bigfoot, um, shapeshifters, demons, ghosts, you name it. Uh, crazy as it sounds, a lot of it has been substantiated. 
Um, and so that's we've been going down there for over five years now. It's been a really educational experience and uh, something that that uh, has definitely allowed us to answer a lot of pretty difficult questions. I asked him about his history with paranormal research. I've been in the field researching uh, for right around 10 years now. Um, And again, a pretty good chunk of that was spent down in this particular area. Uh, I usually work one, maybe two projects at a time. uh, So I stay pretty focused on on a certain area. But, But yeah, right around 10 years. And here's where you can find more about Brandon and the book. Absolutely. The book, uh, The Agony That Remains, uh, it's available at all major markets or outlets, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, and best way to reach me is on my author page on Facebook. It's uh, facebook.com forward slash Callahan author. And that's C-A-L-L-A-H-A-N author. Um, I try to be as responsive as I can. I don't really have a website up and running yet, but, uh, but that's kind of, that'll be forthcoming here. And we got a lot of exciting things coming this fall, too, so keep your eyes out for that. There were a few paranormal teams represented at KC Paracon. Dusk to Dawn Paranormal was one of them. Okay, uh, my name is Jimmy. I'm the founder of Dusk to Dawn. Um, we're a paranormal investigative group. Uh, we go into homes, residences, businesses uh, when people need help. Uh, we're free of charge. We never charge. Um, that's our base. We look for evidence, pure evidence, uh, something to document on video, audio, or uh, in photographs, uh, something that we can say tangible evidence. Um, I do have people that are sensitive on my team. Uh, I use them as a guide. If they sense activity in one area, that's where I go. So, uh, We also do uh, fundraisers at the 1859 jail and Marshall's House in Independence uh, to help the Jackson County Historical Society keep the jail open and running because it's a very historical site, yes. So how busy do you stay as far as, like, people contacting you, like maybe needing some assistance or having questions about, you know, what's going on in in their home or business or something like that? Uh, That's a good question. Um, We stay pretty busy uh, between the tours. Uh, We do residentials. we're going to uh, Warrensburg, Missouri in October to do uh, a presentation for a library there. They uh, explain the equipment we use, show them some videos, some uh, EVPs, some photographs of actual evidence we caught. Um, we do have other people wanting to get into the paranormal. Contact us, ask us for help, uh, for guidance, for instruction. And we bring them in. We try to teach them what we do, how we do it. And my main thing is you do what's comfortable to you. This is how we do it. We're comfortable with this. And uh, if they want to go to a direction where they go all uh, psychics or uh, feelings, that's, that's their belief. That's how they want to do it. And I'm not going to look down on them for it. Uh, Dustin Dawn has been around since 2009. Um, I've been in the paranormal for over 20 years, about 22 years. We have a website, Dustin Dawn. Uh, paranormal.com and we're on Facebook under D2DPI As I mentioned before, several episodes ago I was able to talk to Jason Kupsik, the man who organized Casey Paracon but Jason also hosts the Ectoplasm Show with Josh Hurd. Josh has a documentary that was shown on the last evening of the conference and he also has possibly the greatest podcaster voice I've ever heard yeah, so my name is Josh Hurd. Um, I'm a paranormal author, lecturer, investigator, filmmaker, just kind of wear a lot of hats. A couple of years ago, we made a documentary film called A Brush With Evil, uh, kind of an offshoot of the first book I wrote. And we were done with the coming off the tour, the film tour, and my wife said, oh, we should do a sequel, and I did not want to do anything about that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, she... Uh, I don't know, she talked us all into it, basically. But she wouldn't tell us what she was up to with it. Uh, She had this idea. um, And so we incorporated this uh, this location that we just recently acquired and own now uh, called Malvern Manor up in Malvern, Iowa. And so we shot just over the course of 12 hours, one evening, and shot it all. 
And it was a series of basically like isolation uh, and sensory deprivation type experiments, uh, really, really messing with our heads. And like I said, we had no clue what she was doing whatsoever. So basically like her and our director of photography would pull each of us away one by one, ask us a very odd series of questions, um, you know, more or less asking us, what do you use more as far as your senses go? Uh, during an investigation, sight, sound, whatever. And whatever we were saying, they would take that away from us then in our isolation session. It was jacked up. (laughs) Were you isolated in the house? Yes. Like So what we did was uh, they would take us to one specific room, put us in a chair, tie us to the chair, and then take away, like, either your sense of sight or or hearing or whatever. Um... It was very odd, and I mean, one of the most terrifying things I've ever gone through. Um, she's very lucky; I love her, but um, <laughs> but it was so weird. It was just very odd. Um, the things that we were capturing, the things that we were getting on film, because we were experiencing things that were also being picked up by the cameras and the different recording devices we had situated in the rooms. However, the uh, the guy running the camera, our cameraman Rick. He wasn't compromised in any way, was not having the same experiences as us, and we were just feet away, which, I mean, that opens up a whole series of questions as far as how we're just perceiving our own reality in general. Um, So it was very interesting, very interesting findings that we caught. So it's it's been a lot of fun. People are responding well to the film, though. It's good. I was going to ask you, what are some of your favorite places around Iowa? Like, if you, I'm sure you're a fan of Villisca and all those places. It's and it's kind of nice too because, like, well, where Malvern is situated, we have like it's just a 30 minute drive, and you're in Villisca, so we're there all the time, you know. And I love the Villisca Axe Murder House. I've done it, God, at least seven times already. You know, I mean, it's so much fun. The people that work there and give the tours, they're very accommodating, very nice people. So, yeah, I can't stop singing their praises. But another really cool place is that Farrar Schoolhouse right outside of Des Moines. It, very interesting things go on in that building, and it's a very big building. Um, there's just a lot going on over there, too. So, yeah, I was chock full of spooky places. Um, so if you just go to joshherd.net, that's pretty much where you can find everything that I do. The books, the films, which I think there's like four or five documentaries. Um, all of them are free except for the first A Brush With Evil movie. That was, you know, that costs a little bit of money. Um, but yeah, Ectoplasm shows on there as well. So everything that I'm involved in, we got. So. Thank you. So I had my own table at KC Paracon. With my new big seance banners that looked really awesome, my mom and dad took shifts helping me man the table. Although really, I think they were there to keep me company. And they sponsored my table, so that was really cool. My cousin Lisa came by to Paracon, and I don't get to see her often, so that was really awesome. Well, when I had a good opportunity to get up and roam around the room... I captured the interviews you're hearing in this episode, but I wasn't able to formally interview everyone I wanted to. There was a psychic named Heather Hunter, and she had a gallery reading that seemed pretty impressive. I really wanted to chat with her, but wasn't able to. I've since been in touch with her and hope to have her on the show soon. I finally met Todd Sheets and Hugh McClanahan, They're both from Nightwatch Radio. I met quite a few people who I hope will give the podcast a try. But even cooler than that, I met a few people who were already listeners. I want to give a shout out to Tyson and Viv, who both stopped by to introduce themselves and chat a bit. It is such a cool feeling to meet someone who has been listening to the show. Thanks, Tyson and Viv. The table right next to me, my neighbor for the weekend, was a man named Frank Bennett, a super nice guy who had a constant flow of traffic checking out his book and having serious conversations. I want to thank Frank for keeping me company also. 
and for the tape. Frank was my last interview of the weekend. <laughs> okay, so I'm sitting here with Frank Bennett, who is at the KC Paracon, and he's getting ready to talk. I think in like less than an hour or something, you're getting ready to speak. And so tell all my listeners what you're here doing, and you've got a book, and what you're going to talk about here. Yeah, my name's Frank J. Bennett. Uh, I am a Bible teacher, and my book is called Encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man, which is a true story. And it accounts my, uh, my experiences with paranormal beings growing up in uh, Maryland. And uh, my subsequent investigation into explaining what I had in, in, encountered and experienced so many uh, years later. And in, the, in my effort to explain the Aberdeen Wild Man what I saw, I likened it to the only thing in nature which I think compares, and that is the Sasquatch. And in doing so, I probably reviewed between 1,000 and 1,500 individual Sasquatch encounters and sightings looking for commonalities and characteristics, and I found many. Uh, I also uh, investigated the beliefs of the Native American Indians who had the longest history with the Sasquatch. They are the best source to go to to understand the Sasquatch. And uh, I made uh, quite a few uh, revelations and renderings about them in the book. But uh, in the course of investigating the Sasquatch, uh, I invariably ended up having to uh, investigate the paranormal as well because I found characteristics like and in common one with the other. And in the uh, efforts to investigate and explain the paranormal, I also found characteristics in common with UFOs. And when I got deeper and deeper into explain, uh, you know, in, uh, watching individual video clips and reading uh, how individual encounters go down, uh, I found characteristics in common once again with the Sasquatch. And so it closes this big loop with all three of them. All of them share characteristics in common. And that is suspicious to me because uh, Sasquatch is supposed to be an a individual cryptological creature, a mammal, unlikened with uh, spiritual or paranormal abilities. But it turns up time and time again in more than, uh, more than uh, 75, 80 percent of the cases I looked at. And that's a theory that I have heard a lot in the last couple of years. What I'm curious about is when you're working with the Bible and, you know, you're a Bible teacher and when you're also talking about a lot of these paranormal theories and things and ghosts and UFOs, and I'm sure you get some raised eyebrows. It's kind of a, I'm sure, a sensitive kind of area when you're, you know, with the people that you meet. How do you kind of explain and to maybe some of the more I don't want to I don't want to say conservative that's not the word but maybe you know what I'm talking about. The paranormal happens to everybody regardless of who you are, where you are, where you came up, how much money you got, what religious belief you belong to. The paranormal happens to everybody. And, you know, they'll sift that through the filters of their own belief system. Uh, as a Bible teacher, it is my job to, and this is what my webpage is all about, Frank J., uh, you know, it's Bible by Bennett, by Frank J. Bennett, is that I look at news and events and, uh, going on today, and I'm looking for Bible prophecy and what fulfills Bible prophecy. In the course of which, I live in the same world all of you do, and I've got to look at news and events, like, you know, like medical news and health news and paranormal uh, instances around the world, regardless of what they are, and I've got to put them in context. And I do use scripture extensively uh, to back up and support my suppositions. So uh, you said your website again. What's the name of your book, too? Uh, the book is called Encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man, A True Story. And uh, the website is www.biblebybennett.net. Awesome. I do also. <laughs> and good luck with your speaking. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm hoping my mouth works today. I just... <laughs> You're listening to The Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. International Podcast Day is September 30th, and you can help spread the word. International Podcast Day is dedicated to promoting podcasting worldwide. You may be asking, what can I do to get involved? It's pretty simple. First, head over to InternationalPodcastDay.com and check the suggestions. Second, use hashtag podcast day to join in the conversation. Remember September 30th. Now, let's start the conversation. Welcome to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prossel. I've got a ghost report here that shows that sometimes these ghost reports would serve more as filler than actual hardcore news items. This one gets pretty romantic in its, uh, in its language style. It just doesn't sound like journalism. 
And I think that that was meant to stretch the story quite a ways. It was published on June 27th of 1889 in the Wampatong Times, a newspaper from North Dakota. The headline is, A Ghost Told the Bells. Before the earthquake shook it down, the old guardhouse, or police station, was just across the street in front of the church. Every night for years, an old policeman who had grown old and decrepit in the service of his country and, lastly, of his city, kept watch at the door. He had seen many strange sights and had always said that the strangest he had ever seen was the dead man ringing the chimes from the belfry of old St. Michael's. He had seen the shrouded figure time and again climb up to the bells and, not touching the ropes, which had been pulled so often by living hands, swing the heavy iron tongues against the sides of the bells and clash out a fearful melody which thrilled while it horrified the listener. He would tell you, if you cared to listen to his story, how the ghost had been murdered, for in its normal state it had been murdered by the thrust of an Italian stiletto in Elliott Street. The spirit was to walk the earth, revisit the glimpses of the moon, ring the old chimes, and do other horrible things until the murderer was captured. A few minutes before midnight, the old watchman would see the spectral chimer enter the church doors, forgetting to open them, swiftly and in a ghostly way glide up the steps of the winding stair, pause under the bells by the ropes where Gladstone rings them, pass swiftly on without touching them, climb on into the gloomy belfry, and stop beneath the open mouths of the bells. They yawn down upon it as if striving to swallow up the restless spirit. Suddenly, as if the inspiration had come, the shrouded hand would move silently and rapidly from iron tongue, and the wild eldritch music would swell the air. At the very bottom of this article, it says Atlanta Journal, which I presume is where the article was originally published and then was later picked up and republished in this North Dakota newspaper. That was done quite a bit back then. But I was curious about where this might have taken place. We do have some clues. There was an earthquake. There was a guardhouse across the street from St. Michael's Church. Did a bit of research, found out that it's said in Charleston, South Carolina, which kind of surprised me. But there was a very big earthquake in 1886 in Charleston. It took many lives, over a 100 lives, I think. And so for as romantically told a ghost story this is, at least the setting of it is is very real and a bit of the history of it is very real. Um, on my website, The Merry Ghost Hunter, I have posted this article, and I have three links to other sites that deal with that earthquake. There are a lot of really interesting pictures. So there is some truth behind even this very romantic-sounding ghost story. I'm Tim Prossel, and you've been listening to the audio version of Spectral Edition. I have close to 300 of these ghost reports, all of them authentic articles published in U.S. newspapers between the years of 1865 and 1918. I post one each Wednesday on my website, which is called The Merry Ghost Hunter. I hope you stop by sometime. Thanks for joining us for the Big Seance Podcast. We'd better get back to the table while there's still some candlelight left. Hi, Patrick. My name is Leslie. I am a mail carrier in the state of Ohio. I listen to your podcast while I am on my route, and uh, it has actually gotten me through a lot of uh, worrying days on my route. I just wanted to tell you that I uh, appreciate your podcast. I've only recently started listening to it. And I listened to the episodes of the pets and, um, you know, what happens after um, they pass on. And it really struck home for me because um, March 7th of 2016, um, I lost my girl who was nine months old. She was a, a striped cat and she was just had a heart of gold and she got sick. And there was nothing that we could do for her. So I had to uh, put her to sleep. And um, I've been trying to look for signs that uh, she's still with me or she's around. And um, 
I hope that, uh, you know, she is sending me signs. I, I do see a lot of butterflies, you know, more often um, since she's passed, so I'm not sure if that's her way of um, getting a message to me that she's still around. But I miss her every day. It's still really hard, you know, when I think about her. But um, that podcast helped me um, to realize to, you know, or kind of open up my eyes that, um, you know, she's still there. I just wanted to tell you that I just I absolutely love your podcast. It's it's incredible and the topics are are wonderful. A, a lot of the topics that I'm interested in and you're doing such a great job and um I appreciate you and your podcast. Um thank you so much and I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. I want to thank Leslie for leaving that message on the hotline here at the Big Seance. And that hotline is 775 775- Five eight three, five five six three, and so a special shout out goes out to Rob Gutro, who was my guest on that episode that Leslie was referring to. I am a huge animal lover, and you better believe that I am an absolute mess whenever I lose a four legged family member. I'm really glad that that episode helped you, Leslie, and it was nice to hear your voice. Stay safe on your route. I bet you listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm kind of jealous. Well, I received what I think is my first review in the Australian iTunes store. Cable Digital titled their review, This Would Make the Best TV Show. Then here's their review. If there is one podcast that is on the verge of being picked up by a network, it is this. The Big Seance. I am an avid follower and adore every episode so much. Patrick pays very close attention to detail, which I appreciate, from candles blowing in the wind to Victorian-era soundbites accompanied by great stories and follow-ups. This is an easy five-star any day of the week. Well done, Patrick. Well, um, I am now standing by... (laughs) waiting for all of those calls from networks and I'll keep you posted. Thank you, Cable Digital. One final shout out this week goes out to my uncle Jimmy, who just told me that he's been a listener of my podcast since episode 30. I even quizzed him and he passed a cool surprise. Well, it's time for me to get out of here. I'll see you next time when I bring you my interview with psychic medium, Chris Medina. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. Just click on the Big Seance podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time.